Welcome to another deep dive edition of the Chicks on the Right podcast. Very, very happy to have back with us. It's been almost a year that, um, since we've talked to Brian last. We have Brian Kilmeade, who is, as most of you know, the host of Fox and Friends, of the Brian Kilmeade radio show, and author of now like 12 zillion books, I think is at my last count, um, <laughs> including the latest to be in paperback. This is the book that we talked with you about last right. year, uh, and that is uh, The President and the Freedom Fighter. So this this just came out in paperback like a couple weeks ago or no is it out yet or it's coming uh, out next it's going to be out on the 25th on the 25th okay, okay. well congratulations right. yeah it's great that's awesome so mm-hmm. my because i know we talked about it when it first uh came out in hardcover and so i i don't you it's probably not there's not new information sure in this book yeah. there is yes. Lots of new well, information. What is it? So what I tried to do is uh, <laughs> I added some stuff into the to the epilogue. What I wanted to do is bring it forward because since the book came out, they uh, ripped the freedom statue that Frederick Douglass dedicated of Lincoln. They left it in Washington, but they took out the replica in Massachusetts because they didn't like the look of it. But they took the Teddy Roosevelt statue out of the Museum of Natural History because the Indian was standing and an African-American was standing and he was on a horse. It made it look like white people were too superior, which is nuts. Oh, my and God. With, oh, my God. Yeah. With uh, with this freedom statue, it was dedicated by freed slaves, got together their money 10 years after Lincoln's death, commissioned this guy named Thomas Ball, saying, could you make a statue of the emancipated slaves? So they have Lincoln standing there and an actual guy, an African-American, breaking free of his chains. And, you know, Frederick Douglass didn't love it. He said it was interesting. You know, a lot of people don't like the image, but it stood for 150 years. And all of a sudden there were riots. They almost ripped it down. Cops had to come in. In Massachusetts, they want to be politically correct. They took it out. And I thought, why don't I add this whole news drama around a historical book? And then out of nowhere, they took Frederick Douglass's statue, a bunch of hoodlums, took his statue out of Rochester. So if you're upset about African-Americans in America, the person you want to build an extra statue of Frederick Douglass. You don't want to take one down. So I just thought, let's just talk about what's happened, taking Lincoln's name off schools and how they keep everyone keeps on looking at historical figures and they put them to our rules in our culture. It's totally different 150 years ago. And we should yeah. judge them by the generations that they lived. I thought that would be a good perspective to have. Right. It's a, it is very frustrating because that that's what a lot of people are doing right now. They're judging his, historical figures yeah. by today, which is so, got us so I talked to my daughter. I have a 12 year old daughter and we talk about that a lot now because, you know, in schools today, obviously things are a lot different. I sure wish they would take books like yours and use them in our schools. Yeah. You know, use them in, in, in colleges. Use it. I, I know I'm holding my breath on that one, but man, it would be so nice if they did that. Right. Oh, or just, yeah. you know, you, what you do is you teach people history. And then if you have opinions on it, that's great. But I don't think you should mm-hmm. teach people your opinion on it. Right. And because, exactly. because professors will say, okay, you know, you want to, you sit in that class, you're 18, 19, you want an A. You want a four up. Mm-hmm. You want to get on the teens list. So you listen to this person and they're left wing or right wing and they're going on. And you think to yourself, what do I need to do to get an A on that test? Right. Exactly. And a lot of people just say, no, I'm, I'll take a C, but I got to stand at what I stand for. But it's tough to have those hardcore beliefs uh, about historical figures when you're just trying to get by in college. Yep. We're well, seeing what that would Nicole Hannah Jones say about your book? Right. Um, she would be upset <laughs> about it. I mean, she believes that's the whole thing. It's I go and do these live shows now on stage to give me an opportunity to talk about all the books at once and have some fun with it and keep it conversational. And I just say it's 1776, not 1619. 1619 mm-hmm. is not when we started. Uh, it was 1776. And if you want to look around and say, well, you, you know, we had slaves back then. Yes. So did the Indians. So did African-Americans in Africa. So did, uh, yep. so did Brazil more than anybody else. We did not invent the concept, sadly. It was part of humanity. Uh, and mm-hmm. we began to break free of that. And that's what got us where we are today. Judging, I heard this quote, judging by the people in their time, all our founding fathers were giants. And it doesn't mean because they had flaws or whether they had extramarital affairs. Um, that doesn't mean that they should be taken off their pedestals. Right. right. 
Right. You talk about the, the notion of, uh, of, of people sort of going with the flow just to make sure they get the good grade or make sure they, you know, I think it, it transcends into careers, too. People are doing that in their jobs to make sure they keep their jobs these days, too, where they're just kind of conservatives are, are kind of keeping quiet and going with the flow to make sure they keep their jobs. But do you think that people are changing? Do you see that? There's um, sort of like a, I don't want to say that people are, you know, rising up because I don't know if that's the correct term, but, but people are starting to change a little bit more. They're starting to speak out more. They're getting, you know, a little bit agitated when it comes to the way that things are in this country, how they've been silenced, how they're starting to be squelched. And they're getting a little bit, as Mock would say, bajiggity about that. Right. <laughs> you I'm know? not sure how you spell that, but I know what you mean. I would say. <laughs> right. I mean. <laughs> I see Tim Allen speaking out. I, I see so many people. Uh, and I even watched President Obama this week in his own meandering way just say, stop with the cancel culture. Bill Maher, stop with right. the cancel culture. Well, I mean, what's wrong with you people? When you do cancel people, you're almost afraid of what they have to say or the power they might acquire. You know, when you see Kanye West say ridiculously, ridiculous stuff about the American or Jews in, a, Jews in the world, which is just unacceptable. But don't cancel them. Choose to, you know, buy right. Paul, don't buy Paul if you don't want. Don't buy his albums. I don't anyway. You know, so. Yeah. I, but don't ban him. How dare you? You know, the banning, the taking down, the canceling. I, I really believe we're on the better side of that because uh, all the people that did that, all the celebrities and famous people that did it, it started blowing up on them. You know, you got Harvey Weinstein in the aftermath and you got all these other people. Um, blown up along the way that we're in the middle of the Hollywood community and maybe deservingly so. But the stuff that you say that might be considered controversial, you know, remember Drew Brees said all lives matter. Mm -hmm. I think there was Grant mm -hmm. Napier, who's a play-by-play -play guy, said all lives matter and they fired him after 30 years in Seattle. So... You know, I think that, I think I, the don't you feel because Obama saying those comments, though, it's like a little too little, a little too right. late. Right. Because mm -hmm. now we're we're just a few weeks away from the midterm. So you're you're on top of that because of the job that you do. You're on top of and talking to guests about midterms all the time. So what what's your sense? I mean, we're just a few weeks out now. What's your sense in your own home state about the governor's race? Because now I'm seeing headlines that says Zeldin has a chance. Oh, yeah, they have it as the toss yeah. up. And I do. Why? A couple of things, because crime, uh, number one, taxes, number two, a incompetent or underqualified governor who's an accidental governor. She was a player in Buffalo. If they, people don't know Buffalo, just think for the small town America. So they wanted to upstate, seal up upstate New York. If, in case you do not know, people aren't familiar with this. Upstate New York is is like Iowa. It really is. It is wide open. And, and that is Zeldin land. And in order to sew up Buffalo, Cuomo asked Cochle to run with him. And when she becomes governor, she has no constituency. So she has spent the last two years just trying to get donations. And the quid pro quo is so flagrant where the person who got the COVID contract had run a fundraiser with her two days before. The guy got a $630 million contract from her, ran a fundraiser oh for a couple gosh. of days before. And in it, covered tw charged twice the amount for rapid tests than they got in California. It was a no-bid contract. Oh, my God. So, I mean, all this stuff, wow. she's terrible, she's corrupt, and she has no answer on crime. And she didn't even touch the illegal immigrant thing of them getting dropped off at Port Authority, 20,000 homeless. All she said, one statement, that the federal government's got to help us out. So she just is trying to finish out the clock. And Zeldin's running around, appearing in every crime scene, one of which was his house. What? Yeah. So, yeah. And he is, he is mm -hmm. qualified. He knows state. He knows the military. He knows uh, Republicans. He understands that you're going to have to deal with Democrats here. You don't really need a conservative that's not going to budge because if that happens, then you just, you're a one term or less. So I think that, yeah. I think the, 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 uh, the ducks are lining up for Zeldin. Really? Like, do you think? Because who are the people that would actually still vote for Kathy Hochul? Yeah, I, I'm just amazed with the state of New York City that anyone is OK with. Right. Her. Uh, they blame de Blasio. You know, they have gov they have Mayor Adams actually like the governor. So. I think you have a yeah. good point, but, you know, believe it or not, this is how dug in New York is. If Zeldin gets 35 percent, he wins. Of New York City. <sighs> New York City, because New York City has died in the world Democrat. 
Yeah, but we're is seeing that possible? Del- I, I mean, we're seeing a lot of delusion across the country though with some of these Senate races because I can't believe that you know some of these Senate races are so close. I, I mean, I like, you know you look you at talking? the destruction, just you know, like in Georgia, you know, and in places like that where just it's, I mean, some of and and like JD JD Vance's race. And just people who are were actually on the side of the Democrat. I can't believe that anybody at this point that in any of these races would be even remotely close. Like it should be a landslide for Republicans oh, just all across the country, Brian, because, I mean, they've done such a great job of destroying things over the past year and a half, like better part of two years, that you think that people would just be like, well, of course, we're going to vote conservative. We're going to vote Republican because I can't afford to buy eggs. You know, like my my community is is riddled with crime. I just can't believe that it's not at least that's what we're seeing out here in reality land as opposed. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing that some of these races are close. And I'm just I'm baffled by that. Oh, they're close in Georgia. You know? In fact, they're going to need a runoff, I think, because one guy has got to get 50 percent or they have another runoff. We're gonna, the whole Senate might hang in the balance. Isn't that unbelievable? Mm-hmm. No, I know. it's insanity. I no, I cannot I do- wait. I can't not know. Like she, <laughs> she's like, I'm already, I'm already. So like, much yeah, vodka. I already well, let me give drink. you the, let me right. give you the, it's- the spin. The spin is, oh yeah, uh, everyone's got inflation and we're doing better than most. When in reality, we're 14. We have the, the 14th lowest inflation guy. People ahead of us, Australia, Mexico, China, Japan, um, uh, France, uh, you have, um, most of the Middle East, you know, outside Turkey, which is ridiculously high, South Korea, they all have lower, you know, these industrialized countries all have lower than us. But the spin is, well, mm-hmm. um, I was able to bring you out of this and uh, we're, we have great job, great job numbers, which is true. I'm, a- <laughs> I'm just telling you what the spin is. Just get- Right. Well, the spin I mean, now is g- that the GOP will make it worse, that if you vote for Republicans, right. inflation will get worse, which I'm yeah. just like, how much worse can it get than what mm-hmm. you have already created? It's insanity. I mean, it's just there are a lot of us out here that know that that's spin. But then there's, you know, a, a, there's another chunk of the country that believes this crap. And so <laughs> it's just it's so infuriating. It just it really is. It's madness. Right. Uh, Total then, yeah, madness. Yeah, I think that I think that if we were talking in July and after the Dobbs decision came out and Republicans didn't have that much of a message and uh, the economy was adding five hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand jobs. And then you had President uh, President Biden going over. Would he end up having six straight weeks of of decreases in gas, which was astronomical, you say, "Uh oh, momentum's the red waves have been stemmed." But since that time, you look at climate change, and you look at January sixth. That's what they have, and Trump. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, and abortion. They're gonna, they're gonna hang, they're gonna so hang on to abortion. Right. Too. Oh, yeah, abortion. They're so those are that. the issues. But right. They're moving down, and the other issues of crime, of uh, of of um, of illegal immigration of inflation uh-huh. and the economy of one through four, the one thing they might have if it spun their direction, Democrats' direction, and that would be uh, democracy. The people are, are worried about democracy because everyone's questioning voting. Everyone's questioning the tallies. Everyone's questioning right. procedures. So right or left, every people are getting worried about our democracy. Yeah, I... Should we uh, should we pivot to some fun stuff? Sure. Miriam, before I like. Well, can I just wanna... I can I just compliment you, Brian, on one uh, interview that you did within the last few weeks? And then, yes, okay. we, I think we need to ask you some fun. OK, things. you laid into John Kirby about vaccines in the military a few weeks ago. And in our show, we play a lot of news clips like we yeah. play a lot of clips and react <laughs> to them. And I wanted so much to play that, except that I couldn't figure out how to cut uh-huh. it down without. I mean, <laughs> it was all so good. And so I just want because I was screaming at my television watching you go through that. How, when that conversation ended, like what happens? Do you talk to him off screen? No, I, do you I, like I the news. how? Yeah, you know, I trust the news. I do know him. I do have a cell number. Oh my god! But um, you know that between that and Afghanistan, I, I have no patience for him. When he said, "Why are you focused on how we left? Why aren't you focused on how many people we got out on Afghanistan?" Oh my god! So it was the biggest god. rescue mission of all time. Right. So, yeah, whatever. so 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, oh my I, god. I, yeah, he, he, no, everyone's very supportive at Fox on that. Some people, um, you know, it, it, John Kirby calls the second floor and complains, but there's nothing to complain about. He's wrong. I, that was amazing. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, okay. Angel. I know so you want to ask a, some fun a, stuff. A fun, frivolous question. So um, your favorite interview thus far? Aside besides, from this one, besides obviously. That, you obviously. mean being interviewed. Yeah. You guys wouldn't be allowed. Uh, no, <laughs> we're not allowed. <laughs> like your favorite, your fa- the, the best, the, the most fun interview I'd say that you've ever done with somebody else. Like, like something you're most proud of or that you had the most fun doing wow, or that that's... you were like maybe like f- fanboying over or something. I don't know. That's hmm. a hard one. I would say. Uh, you've talked to everybody. Yeah. Right. You've talked to so many people, which has pr- got to be well, tough. I've... I know. I probably should. I said recently, you've had, uh, you know, uh, Dan Marino was fun. We had. Yeah. I'm trying to think who else. That's a cool one. I like that. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have expected that. You just that. talked to Netanyahu, which was kind of amazing. Like that but was sport, a great. Oh, wow. But you're a big sports guy. I mean, you're such a big sport. Like I read that you wanted to be a professional soccer player when you were younger, right? Yeah, Is when I was true? younger. Yeah, I mean, definitely everybody. Yeah, but there was no professional league then. There was NASL. But you know, I always, I was, yeah. mixed, I started in sports. That's all I was doing. But I'm trying to think yeah. when's the last time we had somebody's significance in here. Um, I mean, the, the one thing that stood out is when Eli Manning won the Super Bowl. So we win the mm-hmm. Super Bowl. I don't know if you guys remember the game when they caught the bell on the, the ball on his helmet. So against the Patriots. Oh, okay. I don't remember So he goes against the Patriots. Okay. Time's running out. They're, they're pulling out his jersey. He's leaning back. He throws it. The guy that catches it is their fourth string wide receiver. And he catches it on his head. He's David oh Tyree. Oh, my gosh. And he, yeah. it, he was called a catch. The next pass went to the end zone, and the Giants beat Tom Brady and the Patriots. So, Bedlam afterwards. I'm covering the Super Bowl. And right away, I knew exactly where Eli Manning's locker was. So, my cameraman is from his the backup quarterback school. And we knew that Manning's going to walk out. The whole country is there to talk to him. So, he's like, hey, I'm a Gamecock from South Carolina. He's like, I remember you. He said, do you mind if we sit in your locker? He's like, what are you talking about? He goes, so our shooter went into the locker and shot out. So when Eli Manning comes forward, he's facing his locker, but we're facing his face, right? So we're asking him questions, and all of a sudden Peyton Manning, who was in his box, come whipping across, and he's the first one to congratulate him. And he's like, and we, no one can hear what they're saying, but. My cameraman shooting it, I got my earpiece in, and I hear him saying, oh, my God, do you realize he caught it on his head? And Eli said, <laughs> "He's." I told you he was a gamer. He goes, that's the guy you were talking about? He goes, yeah, mom and dad were going crazy. He goes, you're a Super Bowl champ. I... You're a Super Bowl champ before me. I can't believe it. So this is top secret. Nobody it. knows it. So we get out to the truck. We look at it. We got this video, and we air it. It was great. And then the Manning family calls us up, Archie Manning, and says, yeah. So we have that video for our family. Oh, oh my gosh. I love that so, so much. Cool. You know, I went to University of Tennessee. So when I'm, a, I'm there? A, obviously the well, Manning family. Yeah. Well, what, what, yeah, back in the day, like the Manning family. I mean, I get like the whole Manning family. That is so cool. I love that. Yeah. With the, I, That's so neat that they call that Archie. I bet you turned it over immediately. Oh, yeah. Right. And uh, plus in, in these yeah. days with attachments, <laughs> it used to be, I got right. it on the tape, but by this time, it's yeah. home, it's out the door. That was no problem. That's so NFL neat. Films wanted it too. That is so neat. I that love that. That's so cool. one of your. I love that. That's one of your like fondest memories. Right. I think that's and so cool. And I really cool. had nothing to do it's with a- it. I was just there to witness it, and we kind of choreographed it. But I didn't ask any questions. Yeah. That is really that is cool. awesome. I'm going to embarrass uh, Amy Jo really quickly b- with this Uh-oh. question because she does an unbelievable Bernie Sanders impression, <laughs> which I'm going to make her do for you because we want to know if you why also. Do you gotta, why do you got to bring me into this? What? <laughs> I That's love it. it. It's really good. not that good, Brian. Like it's you're not. Dying. It's really not. You sound like you're dying. So. Right. It's Brian kill me. So, it's not. so do you do any impressions? And if so, would you please do one for I'm us? I'm sorry. I don't do any impressions. You do. Oh, my God. I don't sing or dance or do impressions. Um, we totally okay. like took it for an impression kind of guy. I don't even really have, I don't have hidden talents. Like, this is all you say. All I have is what you say. <laughs> out of me. 
Really? <laughs> we totally took you for a guy that did impressions. I thought for well, sure. And considering that you do so many things, you're on TV, you're on radio, you're like an author five times over. I'd say yeah. that you're good. You're okay. You're you like don't a need to six, add impressions. You're like a six hours a day guy. Like you're the guy that does three, three shows. Mock said you did two yeah. shows. You have a third show too. You have What Made America Great. And well, that's yeah, on Fox series, Nation as well. So people need to check that out. Eight o'clock. Uh, and it's called One Nation. What? Yeah. What? <laughs> okay. Oh my! So yeah. you have four well, shows. Four is that four? Um, which is that new app we have? I don't know if you you've seen us promo it if you watch the channel. So yep. you see Tucker's doing something on a daily mm-hmm. basis there. They air the radio show there. They stream the radio right. show. So I have this series. I did like fifty something of What Made America Great. They're half hour documentaries, different places across the country. Um. And we might be rejiggering that and make it more like history, uh, investigating history, make it a little bit more active. Yeah. So we'll try to uncover stuff that's going on. Well, it yeah. sounds like you need more to do. Right. No <laughs> They're not keeping you busy impression. enough. That's, uh, that's the only problem, my only regret. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, you got I Sunday. I know. Come on. The game's on. <laughs> well, save them up. Work on that before we talk to you again. So, because yes. I know you're going to write another book, so you might as well just get some impressions going. Are you already start practicing? Yeah. Are you, are you already working on that? That uh, what seventh book? Is it seventh book? Uh, Six sixth history sixth book. book? It would be the eighth. But uh, two, they did two, two sports books. But I'm working on the working title is TJ and Booker T. Uh, how a president. Okay. And. Uh, we're, we're working on a bunch of subtitles, but what Booker T and Washington with Teddy Roosevelt were able to do uh, to accelerate race relations in this country, I don't think is well known. And the good news is they both wrote their biographies so I can wipe out the middleman, like unlike Lincoln, who wrote stuff, but not about himself. These guys wrote about themselves and and Booker T. Washington was born yeah, a slave. Perfect. So he could tell you when the Union soldiers walked into the main house brought his family in and said, you're free. So, I mean, such compelling stuff. I go, I got to do something here. And I think he's such an undiscovered person in history. And Teddy Roosevelt, aside from Lincoln, is the most written about. But maybe we can explore their relationship and how Lincoln, how Roosevelt used him as an advisor for his seven and three quarter years in office. Awesome. Can't wait for that one. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. We know you're, uh, we don't want to keep you too long. So we appreciate your time and talking right. to us about the new paperback version of just, The President and the Freedom Fighter. So always fun talking. Time. I always love talking, love talking to you. Talking to you. Yes. Sign, just go to briankillme.com. Just click on that and I can personalize it. 